Welcome everybody to our special edition of Chess Cafe, Russia and China on board, um, featuring our esteemed panel of guests. I am very excited to welcome all of you. Uh, I mentioned just a moment ago, my name is Alyssa Stone. I am the Senior Director of Programs and Community Engagement here at Mechanics Institute, and I'm so excited to have all of you joining us this afternoon or evening, depending on where you are. Before we begin, I would like to introduce uh, folks who are new to Mechanics Institute, um, to our wonderful organization. Founded in 1854, Mechanics Institute is one of the oldest institutes institutions on the west coast of the United States. Our mission is to provide a center for intellectual and cultural advancement. Located in the financial district of San Francisco, Mechanics Institute serves individuals and families throughout the Bay Area, offering a vibrant library with full-time professional staff, expert instruction, and competition in chess, and a full calendar of engaging cultural events, programs, and classes. One can join the Institute for a small AMD, and many of our activities and services for members are also open to members. Check out our full offerings at MI Live or join us again for an upcoming event, chess tournament, or class, or film. We have something for everyone. For this special edition of Chess Cafe, a bit different than our usual chess cafes, we have an expert panel, including international master John Donaldson. FIDE Master Paul Whitehead, and International Master and Marshall Chess Club Vice President Sal Matera to discuss the World Chess Championship matchup between Ding Loren of China and Ian Nepomniachtchi of Russia. A historic matchup for many reasons, which our panelists will explore shortly. We also have a very special guest joining us as well to provide welcoming remarks. Mechanics Institute is honored to welcome Mr. Asimov Abdramov, the Consul General of Kazakhstan in San Francisco to this special chess cafe. Our discussion will center on the World Chess Championship being held in Kazakhstan for the first time. In case you didn't know, a Consul General is an individual stationed in a place of considerable importance, such as a major city like San Francisco, to advance international trade and commercial activity. Since January of 2019, Mr. Abdramov has held the diplomatic rank of Counselor First Class as the Consul General of the Republic of Kazakhstan in San Francisco. Prior to arriving in our fair city of San Francisco, Mr. Abdramov was the, uh, held the esteemed positions of Charge des Affaires of the Republic of Kazakhstan in Cuba, head and deputy head of the Secretariat of Expo 2017 of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Kazakhstan, Counselor and First Secretary of the Embassy of Kazakhstan in Spain, as well as First, Second, and Third Secretary roles in the Embassy and Department of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Kazakhstan. Mr. Asimov graduated from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Kazakh Humanitarian Law University. And if all of that wasn't impressive enough, he is multilingual in Kazakh, Spanish, and English. Again, we are honored to welcome Mr. Abdramov to provide welcoming remarks during our Chef Cafe event. Welcome, Mr. Abdramov. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. So dear, dear friends, good afternoon. First of all, let me express my sincere appreciation for this possibility to, to join you, to be here today with you. So as me and my family moved here more than four years ago, we were looking for a good place for our kids to continue with their journey of playing chess. So learning from the best of competing and the best and team with the best opponents in San Francisco. So we decided that the Institute would be a place my kids amazing experience playing chess uh, over there. So in my opinion, just keep our kids healthy. So chess is physically demanding as well. So uh, demands opening the craft, practicing opening, starting games. So, so everything that I can yeah, with my kids. So, I must say that chess players practice sportsmanship. Etiquette is extremely important in, in chess and it's a part of education for them as well. 
not only to be a sportsman, but to be an educated person, uh, to be polite, uh, to respect their opponents. And the most important thing I think, I think for them, not only to win, but to lose as well and know how to lose. It's like experience as well for them. Chess is universal. You know, like, uh, you know, people who are pages for planet. So uh, perhaps the peak of sporting women compete for national glory in the Olympics or the World Cup. Chess has similarly fueled people's national imagination, such as when Bobby Fischer challenged Boris Spassky. So uh, my parents told a lot of about this uh, place as well for the World Ch Championship in 1932. You know, at the height of the Cold War, this competition between an American and a Soviet player was watched by millions, especially in my country as well, former Soviet Union. Now we are an independent country, Kazakhstan, So, but we have uh, our own history as well. I would like to emphasize that Kazakhstan's chess players are among of the best chess players around the world, especially our young chess players like Bibisara Sobaeva. Now she's uh, showing a great results in India. Zeynep Sultanbek, Zansayab Dumbalik, Dinara Sadvakasova. Today, this young Kazakh chess player gets the highest ranks in chess all over the world. For example, two-time world chess champion from Kazakhstan recently got one of the highest placed in the Grand Prix that took place in New Delhi. Yeah. So people from Kazakhstan are wearing chess as many other people from all over the world. Today's event is a beautiful sportsmanship between one of the strongest chess players and learn from them. I wish good luck to all the participants and stay, stay strong. Once again, let me express my sincere appreciation for all you are doing for kids, especially for kids with mechanic institutes. My kids every month like strongly preparing for all these scholastic championships uh, the, during, I mean, every month. So it's, I think, one of the best experiences in their lives. Sooner or later, we we'll leave the United States because we are diplomats. But I think these, champ these tournaments will be always uh, in their hearts. I mean, of my kids, in their hearts, and they will remember it for all their lives. Once again, thank you so much. And it's my pleasure and, and honor to be with you today. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. We are so, so glad that you are joining us today. And we hope that you don't leave from the United States too soon. We hope that you will get a chance to grow up playing chess with your mechanics and wherever they go across the world. I'm very, very excited. Um, I am pleased to introduce, uh, I am Salma Tara, who is the Vice President of Marshall Chess Club, um, Paul Whitehead, our uh, Chess Room Coordinator and FIDE Master, and I am John Donaldson, previous Chess Room Director here at Mechanics Institute and Chess Guru at large, international at large. <laughs> um, so a quick introduction for our three panelists. Salma Tara was the US Junior Chess Champion of 1967 earned his international master title in 1976, and was a chess professional from 1972 to 1983. Uh, Sal was a technology master on Wall Street from 1983 to 2015, and retired Sal is the current vice president of the Marshall Chess Club and is president of the Marshall Chess Club Foundation. Paul Whitehead is the Chess Room Coordinator for Mechanics Institute. He is a FIDE, a DF Life Master, and former U.S. Junior Chess Champion. And of course, international master, I am John Donaldson. Um, John Donaldson uh, is the author of numerous books on chess and was the Mechanics Institute Chess Room Director for 20 years. 
John is a 14 time champion, I'm sorry, captain of the US Olympic team, leading them to gold at the 2016 Olympia in Azerbaijan. I am very well pleased to welcome <laughs> our panelists now, and I'm going to pass it right along to Paul. Welcome, everybody, to the Chess Cafe. Um, it's a, uh, a pleasure to be here and um, being here with John and Sal, all of you. Um, we're going to look at um, the games that have been played uh, so far in this championship. Uh, very exciting. Um, and uh, pretty much that's it. Um, folks who have best games, so this is kind of uh, along the same lines. And um, uh, just before I share my screen uh, about the uh, um, showing the games, uh, does Sal or John, do you guys have anything to add to what I've said? <laughs> uh, actually, I was thinking about this these two first two games, Paul. Um, and yeah. I was thinking historically about what's going on. Um, Nepo just looks incredibly relaxed. Um, and Ding just seems to be starstruck to some extent. And I think that people don't realize that playing in a world championship match is incredible pressure. First of all, every instead of playing in a tournament where maybe every other game you're playing somebody you should beat, you're basically playing either the first or the, or the best player in the world. So every day you get up, it's not going to be an easy game. You know that right off the bat. But it also seems that historically what has happened is incredibly strong players have won the candidates, which of course is required to play, play the world champion. And many of them on their first try did not succeed because I think there's something different about a world championship. So the ones I was thinking of was Smyslov won the, the first two candidates. Well, there was the first candidate match was in 1950, which was won by Bronstein. But Smyslov played and he won two candidates in a row. There are very few people who have won two candidates tournaments in a row. The first one, he played Bob Vinnick, and the match was tied. And in those days, the champion retained his title. Uh, three years later, he again won the candidates tournament. And uh, he beat Bob Vinnick. And then, then in 1966, Spassky was clear strongest player in the world. He in three matches in a row. Harris was an incredible player. Geller and uh, Tal. And he qualified to play for the world championship, got onto the big stage, and guess what? The match, the Petrosian. Three years later, showed up uh, again, and, um, Larson and Korchnoi. This time, he figured it out. I think he was, you know, used to being on the stage. He was used to playing Petrosian, and he won. And I was kind of looking at Nepo today going, you're not playing Carlson again. On the other hand, you don't look like you're really worried about what's happening here. And I think people don't realize that that experience is extremely important for that, for that second match. And, and, and every one of those play, I don't know if Nepo is going to win necessarily, and I don't think this match is over by any means. But I think it's very interesting that that stage, that, that nervousness just is in the championship. That's like a great intro to this match, to uh, our discussion, for sure. I mean... Uh, actually, uh, in the um, in the chat, somebody was uh, saying, "How come uh, the players are never at the board?" I think Ding is very nervously and going into the rest area where he's sort of out of sight um, to Nepo. Um, like you said, maybe he's feeling the pressure. What do you think, John? Uh, I would say that. Uh... How to, how to put it, I mean, when they leave the board, they're still thinking about positions. So, for sure, uh, you know, and, and, you know, they have incredible capabilities to calculate without side of the board. So I think, yeah, he might be just finding his way, but I think it's all. Uh, he played a few terms outside of China, you know, because of the COVID restrictions. And so uh, he did play in the candidates tournament and he had a very slow start. And uh, so, you know, he's, he's just trying to find his way. But I would say one other thing is that uh, uh, we didn't mention, you know, the match has been played in uh, uh, Kazakhstan, but it has a really uh, 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 good chess tradition. It was the host of the 2019 World Team Championship. And 
you know, it's it's not sort of in the chess news the way that Uzbekistan, which won the Olympiad, is, but it's still, uh, you know, very much uh, uh, up and coming chess nation. Paul, John, do you think that um, uh, Ding has in the back of his mind that he's potentially the first Chinese world champion? I'm, Nepo certainly doesn't have that problem. There have been many Russian and Soviet world champions. He might, although, you know, they've had plenty of, uh, of Chinese world champions. They've just all been women. Uh, yes. They must have like over a half dozen by now. And in fact, uh, they're going to have, well, they have two women, Chinese women playing for the world title in later this year. Uh, uh, so he might have some pressure there. But the thing to understand is that while they're very successful and, you know, chess players in China, it's uh, not uh, a national sport by any stretch of the imagination. So uh, it's not like, for example, if it was a table tennis or if it was uh, gymnastics or swimming or track and field, you know, chess is kind of a, a little bit of an outlier. And it's actually quite impressive how, how the Chinese have performed when you consider the relatively small base of players they have to draw from. Yeah, I know, John, you know a lot about that. How did the Chinese get so good and with such a small pool of players? I mean, do you have any insight into what's going on there? I, I have some ideas because uh, in 2011, they had the World Championship in uh, Ningbo, which is a city, a small city, about 510 million people. That's small. about... They locate a lot of their talent uh, from the uh, Chinese chess. Uh, you know, people are playing Chinese chess, many, many people in, in China, and uh, they look for uh, people that have talent there, and they, tr they try to draw some of them into uh, Western chess. And uh, China has only competed uh, in, uh, internationally since the late 1970s. That's when the Chinese first competed in the Olympiad in uh, Buenos Aires. Uh, so it's been you know, relatively recent, but almost from the start, the early 90s, their women have been like, you know, among the very best. And it's been a little, a little slower ascent for the men, but of course they've, they won the Olympiad in, in 2014 and they came back on the Olympiad again in 2018. So they definitely, you know, played a very high level. Uh, but if you ask me, I would doubt that you know, we have 100,000 members in the US Chess Federation, and I would suspect that the Chinese have, have less than that. Considering how many people live in China, it's, you know. What are the main cities that, that Chinese play chess in China? Well, see, it's a little bit skewed because if you mean just like play chess or like play at a high level, because the system they had, and I don't know if it's still true because of, what happened after COVID, but they would have all the strong players living in the same city, living in the same apartment block and oh. you know, they together. And that's why if you look until like the last three or four years, a, a lot of those players like Ding being an exception, but but a lot of the other ones being classic examples, they, they all played the Slav as black, they all played the Petrov as black. They were always you know, very, very technically proficient, um, very good end game skills. Uh, uh, but, you know, it's hard to say that, that system is, is still in place because in some ways it, it's, it's not maybe worked quite the way. If you remember, they had uh, Wei. He was a player. He crossed 2,700 when he was maybe, I don't know, maybe uh, 16. 16 or 17 yeah. years old. And he was expected, you know, that he would easily get to 2,800 and he would become like, you know, a world champion, maybe more so than... Uh, Ding, but, but he's not a lot stronger than he was when he was 16 or 17. He's still a very fine player, but uh, you know, it, it, it could be that, that system that they used where they like concentrated town on place, work together, that you know, maybe that wasn't the best. I'm, I'm not sure really. Interesting. Okay, folks, I'm going to share my screen and we're going to look at the first two games of the World Chess Championship. Here we go. Um, we did load a bunch of other games, draws or something to begin with, but actually the, the, um, the tournament really started out with a bang, I think, with um, Nepo 
really kind of in control of the match so far. Um, in the first game, he had white, and I, I think the consensus was from this game was that he was definitely much better, not winning, but kind of maybe messed it up a little bit um, at some point. Um, but let's look at the game. Um, sure. And uh, here I'm going to really heavily rely on John and Sal uh, for commentary too. So Napomniachtchi is white and Ding is black. And I'm not sure if there were any surprises. It's a Roy Lopez. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe right here, Bishop takes C6. Right. I mean, this is a, a move that's been played by Paul White at a northern location, <laughs> but but Paul played it differently, as we'll see than than uh, okay. than, uh Nepo did. Well, I didn't have any uh, line into uh, Nepo's uh, training camp, and by the way, so I found out that um, Rapport is uh, Ding second, which kind of surprised me a little bit. But who is Napomniachtchi second? Do you know? Uh, I think it's probably uh, uh, Russian players that he's worked with long times, like uh, Potkin, and uh, there's a couple others that he's... Do they have an official second? Like yeah, that? yeah. They're not like super strong players. They're, I mean, they're they're very, very strong. They're most of the people that Nepo has worked with in the past for, you know, maybe about 2650, 2700 key days. So in that sense, uh, having reached the group four, the great you know, Hungarian you know, world-class player as one of Ding's uh, assistants, uh, you know, Ding's seconds would beat uh, 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 Nepo's seconds if they were to play play instead of the I see. Happens, but of course they, they're not. Right. But I should say that one thing is you might wonder why did White move his bishop to b5 and to a4 and then capture on c6 when he could have captured on c6 on move four which would be, of course, the exchange variation. Okay, and give us a little chess lesson well, well, here. So, so a6, bishop a4, knight okay. a6. Uh, it, okay, so instead, what happens if bishop c6? You here? take, you take, you d takes. Right. And then white do, doesn't take the pawn in e5. Right, but castles. Castles. And now black has all sorts of defenses. Bishop d6, f6, bishop g4. Bishop d6, pawn f6. Right, bishop g4. Right. Uh, queen d6. Uh, there, there's no shortage of black moves. Okay. Right. But, Shanklin won a nice game against Bishop G4 recently. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, but instead, White retreated the bishop to A4. Right. And now Black played Knight of Six and White Castle and Black played Bishop C7. And White captures and Black retakes. And now White played a lead rookie one to defend the E pawn. Right. So the point here is that Black has fewer choices about how to defend the E5 pawn. And in fact, the real main move is just to play knight d7, I believe is what he did in the game. Right, knight d7. So, so the idea of taking on c6, they, they call it sometimes the durled, delayed exchange. Durled. Yeah, yeah. De delayed exchange Roy Lopez, right. I mean, something like that. Uh, uh, the idea is that the black has less options. And so white here, it was interesting white played d4. That's really the kind of you know, less common approach. Um, the way I've seen Paul play and many uh, of his predecessors <laughs> is to play d3 and knight d2 and knight c4 and try to induce an f6 by black and, you know, try to get black to put all the pawns in his dark square bishop. Okay. But, but here, uh, d4 is something different. You know, white's, uh, uh, you know, opening the game up and, you know, supposedly black has these two bishops that should become good then. Well, white's threatening to take on g7 now. And very straightforward development. Right, so White has a lead in development. That's one of his compensations in the double C bonds for the bishop area. And here avoids the queen trade, queen e3. Right, because after the queen trade, the, the two bishops are going to have to play a larger role. Right. Okay. And so White wants to play f3 and attack that bishop. And... Uh, Right, hitting the knight before before there's a chance to play f3 move to d1. So yeah, now knight f5. And Actually, I'm sorry, could, could I just jump in for a second? I was watching the commentary. Move the knight back to d4 for a second. Yeah. Talking about this possibility of h3 here, with the idea that if queen takes d4, knight d5 is a shot, a serious oh. shot. Wow. 
and they were, and and I forget that the commentators were um, Anish Giri, and I forget who else, but they were they were all shocked by this, and they once they saw it, they said Nepo will definitely definitely play this, and that, I believe it wins. So right. this might have been part of his home preparation. Uh, but he didn't see it. He didn't play it. He played Knight F5 instead. Is H3 significantly, stronger. I mean, H, uh, stronger, but it's not winning. What would happen on Bishop H5? Would White actually play G4? But no, I think it was not, I think it was Knight F5 now. Oh, okay, okay, sure. And it increases in strength. And then you have Queen G3 ideas. They they really felt, Geary also thought that White had a serious initiative here. Mm -hmm. huh. Interesting. That is interesting. I'm, I, I'm wondering about, just because, what about the desperado sacrifice of Bishop H3? Uh, there was something here too. Hold on. <laughs> Let's see. Well, can you take with a pawn and then Queen D4 play Knight D5 again? Oh, there you go. Yes. There you go, John. What yep. a, what a There's move. There's a theme there. It's an, I've never seen that theme before. Right. So what's happening here is that the knight move, it cuts off the protection of the queen on d4. And, and the bishop will always be hanging on e7. So if the queen takes on e3, you've got that intermezzo or position. Yeah, check queen e3, 97 check. Yeah. And if black captures on d5 with the rook, he's not going to probably get enough for his material. Well, there's still the problem of the bishop on e7. On e7. So, e7. so black's yeah. just an exchange down, and for one pawn, it's not going to be enough. Wow. And one of the nice things also, once you uh, you can get that bishop off that diagonal, is you'll be able to play uh, rook ad1 too. I mean, right. So, uh, but but main thing is, I mean, if he goes bishop e6 here, then probably just rook ad1, I would think. Yeah. It looks very nice because the queen's going to probably have to go back to c8. So white's going to. And queen g3 is and coming queen up. Queen g3 is right. coming. But, yes. yes. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Interesting. <laughs> okay. All right, but instead he played knight f5 right away. And okay, so black can't take twice on f5 because no, e7 seems because so. queen e7 and if queen f uh, queen f5 queen queen play play. Yeah. right so queen f5 yeah, queen f5 queen e7 queen f4 queen c5 and white yes. ends up a piece of half. Right. Okay. And so here, so, and if black doesn't capture, uh, it and looks like something like bishop d6, right? Like maybe looks, f6 or something. F6, f6 is annoying, right? Also, the knight on c5 looks like b4 might trap it at some point. Possibly. Look at that. Yeah, interesting. Okay, a lot of tactics hidden in these mm -hmm. simple positions, right? And a lot of it's 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 coming about because. Well, actually, I wouldn't say White so much has a lead in development, but he, he has the move in a position where they're equally developed. Interesting. Yeah. All right. So Black plays ninety six, right? And White trades, and now the specter of bishops of opposite colors shows up. Mm. But White's got this nice position, a uh, still much nice, and the C seven pawn is a target, maybe. Right. I mean, White. Black had two bishops to compensate for the double pawns. And now, now White has a clear majority, and, and the Black doesn't have a bishop pair. And while there's opposite colored bishops, maybe in the end game, they might have Josh tendencies, but in a middle game, they might work very well. All right. Okay. So this is funny because White White's doing what he's supposed to do. Put They're doing what they're supposed to do. The pawns on the colors off of their lips. But it looks funny to see him playing H2 early like that. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, all the rooks are going to get chained up on the D file sooner or later, just because it's the only open file for the rooks, and and you can't just leave the other side to to have it. So even though they're making moves, these kind of temporizing moves, it, it just you know they're just right, just kind of maneuvering around. They, they're playing moves that they could have Could Black have tried queen b4 for, uh, I don't think it's that relevant. You know, okay, so b6, a3, a5, knight e2, and, and here come the rooks. Yep. So White just wants to do it so that 
it's going to become an end game with bishop and knight versus bishop and knight. And white will have the better pawn structure. And the question is that is that enough? Of an and this was apparently a, a, a not a very good move, mm -hmm. c6, because it opened up an inroad into the black position. There was apparently no reason for black to have necessarily done that. Right. But probably if he wants to trade on d3 and then play, he doesn't want to have the c7 pawn hand. Okay. That's probably why he did it. But but you wonder if he should have just sat still and played like king f8, you know, and try to, you know, get his king ready to come to the center of the board for the end game. And he can't he can't take with the queen now anyway, because white will trade. I'm sorry. Um white will trade. Right. And then play bishop c7 and win a bunch of pawns there. Yeah. So um, so he took with the knight. And right. now queen f4 was very strong. Mm -hmm. The idea of coming into the eight. I mean, at this point, the old Russian expression, your know, white's playing false. Two results, a win or a draw. There's no chance to not to, to, to generate one chance. All right, here the red is bishop c7, inning, so it's out of the pin, and white plays bishop d6. And I think Ding is just holding on by a thread here. Yeah. Um, queen d7. And so if bishop takes c5, I think black gets a ton of counterplay with queen g2. Right. It's the old story that when you have a, an advantage, you positional advantage. You don't want to cash in your chips too early. You want to only win material when you still keep your positional trumps, or at least not give your opponent some compensation. So there's no reason for white to hurry here. I'm going to remember that for my next tournament game. No, Paul's a very good technician. <laughs> All right, 93, 96, f4, and this is apparently this is a very strange moment in the game, I think, because white starts putting his pawns on dark squares now. I mean, did you, were, what did you think? The commentator Ian hated that move. Actually, they also hated h4, which comes yeah, very soon. Yeah, it's uh, like White does, did everything right by putting his pawns on light squares and then starts to do everything wrong by putting back on dark squares. It, it was very odd. Well, so I think he's doing it because he, he just wants to try to win the pawn on c5. And, and to try to grab some space. I think thinking of like knight f5 first is just, yeah. because the other problems you have is it, it's hard to avoid a push change if they don't have the bishop on d6 defended, yeah. which is how things started to work his way out of this mess, I think. Yeah, I think it pretty much, I mean, uh, I think black kind of, this was a nice move, I think, h5. Um, but again, maybe this is a, uh, Another pawn goes on the dark score, and yet another pawn goes on the square. It just looked kind of the wrong way to play. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I think that they they were thinking maybe some maneuver with the knight, like f1 to e3, and more more a g3 thing. But h4, they just instinctively didn't like. And now black offers a trade of queens, and even if he loses a pawn here. Um, and here, if queen takes d6, queen f7, and I don't think... Uh, f4, seven. Yeah. But knight f5 is... Knight f4, knight f5 wins for white, I guess, because mm -hmm. there's no double check with the knight. No. Right. Okay. Right. Little yep. tactics. Um, okay, so instead, Ding brought the bishop back to defend on c6. Now the knight came into f5, but now Ding is able to force the trade of the queens. And, and Napomniachi tries to make something here with the with his advanced e pawn. But Ding's king comes back. Yeah, Ding seems to be all right here. Yeah, I think so. That that was this, and this thing, put bringing the knight to d three kind of caught this equally. Again, this is another attempt by you know knight takes e six would be terrible here, I think, of course. So white takes on c six, 
because the black knight would be better than the white bishop. And now we're getting into bishops of opposite color. Yeah, it's going to be a draw territory, sure. and the players agree to a draw. Mm -hmm. All right, that game was somewhat exciting, but the next game is absolutely much more exciting. This was today's game, um, and um, really, uh, it, there, first of all, there was an opening surprise. This time, Dingham, of course, is white. The players alternating colors. Um, and we get H3 here. Right. So Theoretical novelty. Right. And I would say that this team, obviously, you know, the, the suspects that it was Rapport who likes to play a lot of uh, unusual openings that this might have been his uh, suggestion. So this has Rapport written all over it. Yes. But, you know, the thing is, why do, why do these guys play moves like this? And, you know, why, and not, and not just in a world championship ma match, but now in modern chess, you see all these uh, opening setups that you wouldn't see before. And it has to do with the fact that uh, with these very powerful uh, chess engines, uh, the, the amount of opening theory is, is just like grown by leaps and bounds. And so if there are like, you know, high level professional players, you know, they can be pretty certain that their opponent has looked at much of what, they look it's completely open i mean they use the computers the same engines uh, it's very hard to surprise the standard systems. so that's why you see like gauge three and one at least i thought that they can be five and playing exchange variation and then h3 is can be very much part of a white setup that idea is uh, that it denies Black's uh, pieces of use of the G4 square. So an exchange variation, it makes sense to play H3. Of course, you would never play it so early. It would be like a move nine or move 10. Rapport probably wants to right. follow up the other with idea, G4. The other idea is it's simply G4. It seems right. like, uh, you know, it's just very, very popular, uh, you, know, you know, very aggressive. Uh, way to play for uh, now. I, I saw recently a game, uh, not between, of course, these really high ranked players, but uh, pretty good players where white played an early h3 in the Queen's Gambit and black played c5, playing a like a Tarash kind of thing, kind of um mm -hmm. approach. I think black probably has a, a number of ways to play here that are probably right. pretty good, right? Um, but that's sort of the appeal of playing. Three a non a non suggested a six, which is right. kind of a funny, uh, uh, funny uh, symmetry right. about it. But but a six is is a really important move for black. Now in this position, on, uh, instead of I hadn't played it, uh, I'm in the right. idea is to try to induce white to take on d five because. Black threatening to capture and then support the pawn with B5. Right. I I just I saw Anand and his first reaction was A6. A6. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can but uh, okay, so Nepo took on C4 leading, and this. I, I'm sorry. Can I just jump in for one second? Yeah. I, don't you, do you find that that thing to me is a very classical player? Um, and I'm not just talking about openings. I mean, I think he's very um, he's very strong. He's very positionally and strategically based. Report has a unique style. I find that a strange combination. Right. Well, the thing to keep in mind is that uh, both these players have multiple seconds, and uh -huh. others, and and some players will, some of the seconds will be on site, but usually just like one or two. It's a little bit too complicated to have more than that, and and the principal seconds will be there, you know, not just for like. The chess side of things, but also like you know for emotional support and you know and guidance. Uh, but then there'll be a whole big team back home, you know, in China and Russia that will be helping in the preparation. And his job will be sort of to assign tasks for everybody to work on, and he'll get that material back from them, their homework, and then he'll synthesize the material and he'll present it to the player, you know, digestible bits, if you will. Uh, so it is true that, you know, you, 
I guess, you know, the idea is, you know, somebody, it could also be that, you know, rapport is played uh, a lot of times in the Chinese league and uh, uh -huh. it would probably be well known. Yeah. yeah, that's so interesting. So it could be that they have a friendly relationship. It could be that they have a rapport. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, um, Apparently, Napomniachi smiled when H3 showed up on the board, showing yeah. just how relaxed he is um, during this during this championship so far. So E3, C5, Bishop C4. This is kind of pretty typical, typical um, Queen's Gambit, to, uh, except where H3 H means nothing. Uh, where three is a strange move. Yeah. Right. So a good, good choice. Um, yeah. well, well, of course, the, the, the normal defense is, you know, you, you oftentimes have to place the Grunfeld. Uh, so it could be that uh, what Ding's hoping for is that he, theoretically this position might not be very dangerous for Black, but practically uh, Nepo wouldn't have a lot of experience with it. Maybe wouldn't feel comfortable. That was the hope, perhaps. Right. And for all you chess folks out there, the black pawn can, the white pawn on d4 is not hanging because at the end of all those exchanges, white will play bishop b5 check, winning the black queen on d4. So um, black plays bishop b7, a4, b4, right. now, now the play, it, it very much resembles uh, a Moran. And, and specifically a uh, Moran where white plays uh, with e5 instead of d5 in the main theoretical position. And so you, this, if you look at the match that was played between uh, Anand and uh, Ramnik back in, in Bonn in the mid 2000s, I believe it was, that match, you're going to get this similar sort of setup where black has the double f pawns, but he has the open g file and he has the powerful bishop on b7. And, now, somewhere in here, they said that White was actually had missed some promising way to play, but within like 10 moves, it, Black just ended up with like an overwhelming position. So I'm not sure where, where it was. I, I, I saw a comment by Anand saying that he th there was a position like this where White's rook was on E1 and he was able to put the bishop back on F1 instead of the pawn. Oh, that would H3. be very significant because so, that would definitely give the king more projection. So it so it resembles that position, but the white bishop has to come back to c2. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, black taking back with the g pawn and then castling queen, putting the rook on ga and then castling queen side. I mean, this is this is like Napomniachi's kind of, you well, know. I think it's anybody sort of dream. Anybody, yeah. yeah. So very difficult position already for white, I think. And I'm... I, I'm not sure, not having um, done um, my, a great amount of homework on this game. <laughs> yeah, which is just play today. Today. But the thing here is just black has open lines against white's king. And, you know, black's king will go to b8. And it looks like, you know, those pawns are far advanced, but there's no way for white's pieces to take advantage of it. And this f5 break that he played in the game, that just like broke open the position. Yeah. Wow. You know, he wants that bishop on b7 to be everything it can be. Right. And soon this is like a Rubenstein game. It reminds me of Rut Levy against Rubenstein. It's all <laughs> black pieces are attacking. Yeah. And you can't break through on the c file. That's a killer. You just, there's nothing happening on against Black's king. Yes. So here, I mean, the most want to play like d5, or I guess e takes f five what well, that's my rook takes d4 or something yeah. like that no. right and then i have three can't capture back without a one rook takes g2 check. and then rook and then i mean that like okay oh, let's yeah. just okay. yeah check right now h2 or even rook f2 check h2 check that looks like it's gonna oh be yeah, yeah i think you're right check check you have to go. I mean, Queen King F1, Queen Bishop H6 is coming. This is King E3, yes. and that's mate. Right. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure there are other variations like that. Pretty scary for White. He really can't afford to open up 
the um, the diagonal like that. So he goes back. He's just played bishop d3. Right. He has a sharp back. Yeah. It's just it, it probably completely lost now. Knight comes back to c6. This is an attempt to plug the g file. But I saw Napami actually play rook g5, and it was like boom. Yes. <laughs> he really, you know. Uh, that's the thing about him. He just he plays very quickly. He's a very intuitive player. Um, and right, once he's the attack, he's he's, he's incredible. Um, and I and I always felt I've not always felt, but when we play Carlson, it's it, like he was trying to play quote unquote good chess, and that was a, yeah. Um, <laughs> playing good chess, bad team. I'm playing Carlson. <laughs> <laughs> this, this, right. this is him. Black white is in, in tremendous trouble here. Any yeah. comments, guys? Well, um, knight h7 is the joke there. I mean, it just seems he, when the knight was on g5, it looks, yeah. stupid, but I don't know. I mean, maybe it's the same idea. Black is just going to have. You know the two bishops and the pawns for yeah so knight seven. Just take on c two, you think, Paul? And then take on e four again. I don't know. I think yeah. In any case, Black's going to end up with uh, yeah two bishops uh, and a bunch of pawns for a rook and a knight. Right. And particularly, he's going to have this dangerous queenside pawn. This is just pretty bad. Really bad. As well as the queen side pass. Well, that was also maybe, maybe you want to mention that little trick there. What King H one was all about is Black was threatening Bishop F three and Bishop H two. Check. Right. And oh, nice. Rook nice. Rook nice. Rook okay. Rejected. Right. So this is a po possibility after Bishop F three, Queen F three, Bishop H two. Check and winning the rook on D two. Right. Okay. Threatening to make a queen, which he stops with queen h6. And the rook's trapped. And the rook's trapped. And he just gave up. Yeah. Yeah. Was... Okay. Very one sided game. Yeah. Yeah. And one thing when we can say about the two players is that uh, uh, Dean has a shown genius throughout his career. Um, just what the competitors that he played, he got to a very poor start, but then he came back very strongly. So, uh, more so than uh, Nepo, uh, who uh, has a tradition of kind of melting down when things don't go his way, uh, I would say that Ding is, you know, better set up to uh, for a comeback, but he'll really have to do something because he. He was decisively beaten in this game. And the previous game, he was just, just managed to save it, you know, barely. So he's he's not been playing at his normal level, I would say. And that's part of the Nepo has managed to get in conditions where he's not comfortable. And so that's what the world championships are about. Is these guys are so super strong that uh, you just try to find some place where he's less comfortable than others. Um, we've looked at the games. Um, if anybody wants to, you know, pepper us with interesting questions or any questions at all about um, the match or chess or anything, please feel free. Um, I'm not sure how that's going to work out with the. Uh, um, uh, uh, welcome, more than welcome. Uh, I think you can unmute yourself and even ask questions. Um, uh, yeah, so any folks who are interested in asking questions, welcome to type them in the or welcome to unmute. We can shift it to a person. Yeah, we can even go back and take a look at a uh, move in the game if anybody wants to. 
Sal, what time, what time in the morning was it when games are starting for you? It's a little 5 bit. 5 a.m. 5 a.m.? So for us, it's 2 a.m.? 2 a.m. in the West Coast. It's not practical. Right. But what I remember is that uh, flying from the United States to uh, Kazakhstan was perfect because normally when you fly uh, to Europe before an important chess competition, you would want to arrive you know, quite a few days early to acclimate to the time difference. But it's so far away that is Kazakhstan, you know, it's like in, between Russia and China, that it's uh, 12 time zones different than the West Coast. Wow. So uh, flying uh, from the US on Lufthansa to uh, uh, Germany to Frankfurt, you miss that overnight, you know, sleep, if you will. Uh, and then you have to wait several hours for the connecting flight so that you end up arriving on the second day around midnight in Astana. So if you can manage to stay awake for that period, you would be very, very tired when you arrive, and our team did. And then when we finally got to uh, Astana, you know, checked into the hotel, we woke up the next morning at nine o'clock. It felt like normal for us. So that was, you know, not a very common occurrence with the balance. So Alexi uh, asks, who's going to win the match? Um, uh, are we taking a poll or, uh, I mean, I think it's kind of early to call. Like John says, um, Ding has shown a lot of comeback fight in his, uh, in historically. So we can't write him off yet. Um, yeah, but I would say having seen the first two games and keeping in mind that they play 14 games and only continue on if the, if the match is tied at a faster time control, I would say that Nepo, you know, if the odds were like people, I would say in general, odds odds makers were favoring him slightly if, if for no other reason than his experience, uh, you know, in a previous world championship match that, that Deng lacks. Uh, I'd say the odds for his success have definitely gone up uh, uh, significantly after these first two games. So it's going to be really interesting to see what happens in this next game because, uh, you know, the, the big uh, order for Dane will be like to be solid probably and just stop the bleeding and try to play just like a good error-free game. And for Nepo, you know, he's going to want to try to increase that lead. And of course, what we saw in the match between uh, Nepomniachtchi and Carlson is that uh, you know, you know, you can be down one game with 14 games and, and that's very realistic to have a chance. You're going to get a lot of whites. You can pick your moment to try to come back. But you get down two, two games, then you're like, like right on the precipice. And if you get down three games, then, you know, it's pretty much over. Uh, so, so I would say for, for, for Ding that the, the order is block this next game and then look for his chances in the following game, but not trying to overreach because, uh, you know, he, he's, he's in, there's a danger right now. If he, if he loses another game, then he's going to really be in the hole that he might never be able to dig himself out of. Yeah, he has to find his footing and just, you know, he's got to calm down. I think it's time to make a boring draw um, if he can. Yes. Uh, and then press a little bit when he's got white. Um, not play the stupid H three move and play his hit, play his game, play a Catalan or whatever he does, and right and, and play good chess. Uh, right, just, I think you know the idea is you know when you're white and you're playing like these two world class players, sometimes you know you just try to get some small advantage in some positions that's very comfortable and just grind and grind and grind. But of course, what makes these guys really great is that uh, they're really good at everything. And one of the skills that, uh, that almost no players in the world, except for they have, is like to defend slightly unpleasant positions. They seem to do it effortlessly. You know, that, you know, positions that, you know, that civilians like lose all the time. But these guys, like, they, they like never seem to lose. You know, they can, they can just really, really, really uh, uh, take a lot to be done. I had another thought. I mean, Pagliacci really wondered about him being really a serious challenge to Carlson in this in, in an upcoming world championship match. What do you think his chances were? I mean, he's a he clearly botched his first try, but 
would he have stood a better chance against Carlson? And maybe did that might have had something to do with Carlson backing out of the world championship match. Uh, I mean, I'm not certain that the Pomniachi is not really a dangerous opponent. Well, he's a dangerous opponent, but Carlson's Carlson. And yeah. if you look at, there's like 50 ELO points standing between the two. Yeah. And, uh, I, I think uh, he would have been better than he did the last time. But he would have lost. Uh -huh. And period. Yeah, yes, yeah. he would definitely have lost. And uh, as to what, you know, Carlson, I think that uh, there's a couple factors in play. One is that, uh, for example, when Kasparov defended his title, it was every three years, not every two years. Right. And it might not seem that significant, but, you know, when you're like the world champion for like a decade, you know, it's like you, you're ended up playing extra matches. And then I think the uh, second thing is that uh, in the case of Carlson, uh, you know, as compared to, to, to Kasparov, when Kasparov was playing these world championship matches, the preparation time was maybe like, you know, three or four months. Now it's maybe like six months to nine months. That's what it takes to really prepare for one of these matches. And during that time, you really don't want to play too many tournaments because you don't want to give away your preparation. You don't want to play with one hand tied behind your back because you're hiding all your prep. Uh, so, on, you know, so it's clear that there are arguments to be made both ways. I mean, there's a lot of really great players now. They shouldn't have to wait three years to have a crack at the title. But considering that, you know, if you have to prepare like, you know, six to nine months for a match and you're playing one of these matches every two years, it means like, you don't have many many opportunities to play in other tournaments. And so I think that's part of it. I think also though, you saw like this move H3 on move four. That, you know, who who could have guessed that like you would see a move like that? You know, I mean, all of you know, you're not supposed to move your pawn in front of your king, like, and you're not supposed to move those pawns in the opening either. So what are these guys doing? And I think also that, uh, you know, who could have expected? I remember when I first started playing chess in the early 1970s, we had a, a member of our Tacoma chess club and his name was John Ward. And he was a very nice guy. And he used to always play the London system. And they called it like the pensioners opening. And it's like, there was like no, uh, uh, no, you know, regular chess player wanted to play the, like, the London system. And then all of a sudden, you, you know, you fast forward to like around 2015 and like all these players, Carlson included, are playing the London. I mean, like, why? Well, the reason why is, is, is as Jonathan Tisdall uh, said in his recent New and Chess interview, if you could take one thing back in life, what it would be, he said, engines. Mm -hmm. And it's like these, these chess engines, are they're like, you know, just so powerful. And, you know, this last weekend, I saw Jim Tarjan win a tournament in, uh, in uh, Reno, Nevada, and, He's probably never used a chess engine. Oh, no, 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 no. He would took a couple of buys during the tournament. He was analyzing his games in between rounds. You know, uh, at, at Larry Christensen, maybe 25 years ago, he referred to like the first people that started using chess space is the army of the iron bus. And the idea was that these people would just like park themselves and just, you know, spend eight or 10 hours every day uh, studying chess and using these computer engines. And, uh, you know, now the greatest talent that, that really good players have is they can look at uh, computer evaluations and they can appreciate, you know, in a very subtle fashion, not in a really crude one, where sometimes the, the computer will say equals, but it requires black to play like, you know, really perfectly on right. all these force moves. And other times equals, it's like, you know, really easy moves. And that's a kind of an exaggeration, but but at the really high level, they can find situations that are like, you know, more nuanced. Right. Okay. Outside. It says it's equal. Now you show me how to draw the position. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And you know, maybe it's a position where they 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 turn up the the, the tension and and you know the guy's a little bit tired and and you know he gets a little he spends a little bit more time on the clock and they kind of like use all those elements together to try to, to craft their winning chances. You know, a couple of things I'm thinking as you guys are talking. Um, Carlson didn't know who was going to win the candidates when he started hinting that he was not going to defend his title. 
Um, right. Yes. So I don't think it was it was fear of Nepomniachi. No, um, no. And I also think um, I, I think it was a Botvinnik quote. He once said, and the two what John is just saying about defending the title every two years is very important. Botvinnik, who used to do, do three years, and of course he'd always play the next year because he win the rematch. Um, always said it took one year out of your life to play a world championship match. And I, I don't think he's talking about losing that match preparing. Preparing his feeling was he was going to die a year sooner because of all it took out of you. Um, right. So, which means that Bavinik should have lived to be like a hundred instead of like I think he died when he was like in his mid eighties. Right. Yeah. Yep. Yep. He should, he should have been around for longer. Can we go back? Actually, actually, I think there's some questions in the chat, but I had just the one quick thing that you guys talked about much earlier. I found it troubling that Ding is is sitting in the room instead of sitting across from his opponent. Um, we spent all this time and during COVID going, gee, I wish I could play over the board. I'd, you know, I'd like to, you know, it's my opponent and everything else. And, and th he's not even sitting across from Nepo. It's almost like he doesn't want to be there, which is bizarre to me. Um, and I always, re when, when I see something like that, I refer, I, I think of, in my 60 memorable games, Fisher was playing Trepanovic, who was basically a draw master. Nobody was able to beat him. Um, and Fisher won the game, but he at some point he says something like he was he was thinking about a move, and he said all of a sudden Trefanovich got very very still and very quiet, and Bobby felt that Trefanovich was was sensing his brain waves, um, and he immediately saw the cheapo he was about to go into, and I <laughs> and I think I'm serious about this. I think had he not been sitting at that board, sensing his opponent and getting his you know, feelings of what the mood was, et cetera, et cetera, he very well might've fallen in the trap or if he'd been sitting in a room by himself, he might've fallen in the trap. I, I think there's something about over the board chess that you have to sit across from your opponent and have an idea what he or she is feeling at any given moment. Mm -hmm. and, and in poker, they call it tells, right? I mean, you're, you, you're always looking for that. I remember Korchnoi was uh, Korchnoi and Spassky. I mean, didn't Korchnoi always, or it was Spassky who kept going out of the room and uh, or and looking at the demo board or something like that? Well, that was their their seventy eight match, and uh, it wasn't first a world championship. It was like I think a candidate's final to determine who would be the challenge for the right. world championship. And uh, there was really bad blood between them. It was one of the most contentious world champ, uh, high level matches of all time. And that was a world championship match. That was 78. No, 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 no not Spassky. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Yes. It was before, yep. one was before that. And Spassky at one point took to wearing swimming goggles at the board. And it, <laughs> at one point, uh, fortunately, it was like, three or four games ahead and it looked like it was going to be over but then like he lost like three or four games in a row right and it's a, it, quite a dramatic match and there were allegations that both sides you know that that Spassky was using uh, you know uh, uh, I was very said about and Spassky this is before their match. He said, "When you're playing Spassky, this again, he's sitting across the board from him. He says you don't know whether he just hung a piece or he sacrificed it because he's completely uh -huh. deadpan um, and gave off no no information with his body language." Right, but of course, another world championship match where the players used were an actual world championship match where both players were not at the board at the same time was the. Uh, the match between uh, Ramnick and Topolov? Topolov? Yeah, toilet gate in uh, another <laughs> gate. Right, right. Because then they started, you know, alleging that there were like all sorts of, you know, you know, go to the restroom and find like inspiration. You know, they, uh, uh, you know, it was a very strange match. You know, what can one say? Uh, so such things have happened before in the chess world. I know of no bad relations between Ding and Nepomniachtchi. I, I don't think that would be the case. Uh, it's not like you know, obviously they both want to do well, but uh, they don't mean we should go for their opponents. Speak, you know the top players much better than I do, or I mean, I don't know them hardly at all. But I mean, there's a real, they're really collegiate together. It seems to me like that that there's not much bad blood now between the top players. No, I mean, I mean person, on a personal level, right. like there was in the past. I think there, there's, I mean, there's a couple of reasons that come readily to mind. One is they play against each other much, much more frequently. Right. And two, there's just a lot more money involved. 
and uh, you know, and planning to go around for the the, the really elite players. So oh, I think right. that uh, uh, you know, it's like the guys that play in the NBA playoffs. They uh, they they really want to do well, but on the other hand, they they you know they're also getting like you know tons of money to play. Alexi, uh, as asking um, about spectators at World Chess Championship matches. Um, What's the question? Do they allow them now even like uh, in the rooms? Um, <clears throat> all the allegations about electronic cheating and all that kind of stuff are they even allowed are spectators even allowed at world championship matches i would probably yeah i don't know but um, i know the answer ah uh, yes sophia <laughs> no they have a they have a um like a now they have a screen where they can't see the spectators so the spectators are behind a screen i mean i think the, the most spectators was Magnus versus um, Vichy, if you remember that match, the first one. Was it in New York? No, New that York. was in India. That was in, I think it was in Chennai. That had a ton of spectators, but they had, you know, they had a blackout screen, so the players can't see the spectators at all. And the matches that they had in New York, that one really felt like a fishbowl. You could walk in, but they only had enough room for about 30 people at a time. Did okay, sell I thought they couldn't see out. The they players. can't see out. They can't players. see spectators. Right. They can't see them at all. They're blacked out. But this site looks like they can see them. Uh -uh. I don't know. I got a weird feeling because it feels like a circle. Did anybody watch it? Like the opening ceremony kind of thing? When they did the walking tour? No. It was, it was kind of, it felt very sort of round and very open. Like there's, because they were in a hotel and I the St. Regis, which is obviously a beautiful hotel. So just looking at, at it from an organizer's point of view, um, and they seem to have some sort of like seating behind there, but it was very empty. There was a lot of seats open. So there wasn't many, there was only like 20 spectators. So. Melissa, I don't know if you're seeing anything in the chat. I only see, I see comments more than questions. I do see that Mike Walder is offering to show some Analysis, is that right, Mike? Yeah, I, I haven't seen many questions. One just came in from Michael Anderson about did Dangler and change hotel? Um, and otherwise, we have some comments from earlier from Mike um, offering to, to show some uh, analysis. Um, but if there are any additional questions, please feel free to pop them in the chat or feel free to unmute yourself if you'd like um, to ask your question directly. I like the comment about uh, Korchnoi being a chain smoking Stalingrad survivor. Well, no, not Stalingrad. It was uh, Leningrad. Leningrad, yeah. Right. right. Yeah. No, if you wanted to take a look at two positions, uh, there are two that you actually, one of them you stopped on. I, I'm uh, willing to take a quick look. Yeah. Is it game one, Mike? Uh, both games. Uh, uh, the, the one where H3 where, uh, was suggested. Um, Right. Um, oh, in this game, okay. Uh, in this game, we can go back to knight takes f6. That if, okay. if instead back in here. No, in in this game here, yeah. If instead of knight takes f6, if he played knight takes c5, white is slightly better. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a small it's a small advantage, uh, you know. But um, but you know, white is slightly better. Knight takes f6 was was uh, was. No, opening the g file was almost suicide there. Yeah. So in this yes. case, it's white who gets the G file open, right? Bishop C5. Oh, no, you can take that oh. queen. You, you want to take on F. Oh, yes. Yeah. So what, what is the, what happens here exactly after D D I C5. take C5? Yeah, it's just, it's, it's just a slightly better position for oh, white. How, uh, does go? how does black play here? Uh, black, uh, so um, black can go ahead and, and uh, he, has to, he has to take. He has to, he has to take. Right, and now you need a good move for black, probably. Um, which is why he's slightly better. Uh, right, but still, uh, what, what does black play here? It's like bishop e4 or something, or uh, um, he needs to try to regain this pawn quickly, right? Maybe queen c7 or rook c8, or um, yeah, yeah, I'm trying to remember what they said. I, I'm sorry, I don't. 
Um, it seems like right after queen c7, my mind played bishop d2, queen takes c5, rook c1. Yeah, it getting, like you're getting, getting your development out yeah. quickly. And then, of course, the question is, what's the knight doing on a5? Right. So maybe it's rook c8? Yeah, that looks right. Rook c8. Right. And you can't now, play queen e2 because of knight b3. So I think the um, launch, and you can't play e4 either. Well, queen e2, knight b3. Rook b1. Oh, and then you take back with the knight on yeah. c5. Yeah. Okay. And white would have the two bishops, and I can see that. What was yeah. the question about the other game? So the other game where you had played uh, h3, right, uh, showing that tactic, that that, uh, that is something that Geary pointed out. Uh, but he All even right. needed to sacrifice himself to find it. In the opening, Paul. Oh, yeah, in the opening. Exactly early the middle game, I think. Oh, right. yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. The, bishop, the bishop's on g4 or something. Okay, so, so on, on h3. Um, uh, the uh, only the only move that keeps this under control for uh, black is rook e8, um, protecting the bishop. Now, you're if you take d4, <laughs> I'm attacking d4. Yes. Yeah, and you're still attacking d4, but yeah, but not now. Now knight d5 doesn't do anything. So if if pawn takes bishop, then you can play queen takes d4. Again, why uh, this is much better d4. than pawn mm -hmm. takes bishop? Why can maintain a small advantage by playing? Um, uh, don't take the bishop, play queen uh, to g3 instead. Mm -hmm. and, and, and white is slightly better. Okay, well, those are interesting comments. Yeah. 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 Well, again, that was Geary, not me. So, but uh, actually, I was, I, I was watching that, Mike. Geary, Geary, he snuck a look at the uh, the engine. Yeah, he said that. <laughs> yeah, he said no, that. I will say this. Uh, 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 Geary, he's a, a you know, who, who was here at the Mechanics Institute, by the way, uh, during the, uh, the tournament that was held in San Francisco, he, he's not, he knows an incredible amount about chess and he's very, he can be very funny too. Yeah. He has a very good sense yes. of humor. He does. And he's the new CEO of chess.com. Right, right. Which, which looks like it'll soon run out of things to take over in the chess world and we'll have to move to other, other parts of the world, take over. <laughs> Alexi, how's your new job? Uh, well, I've been chief science officer for a year for Chessable, but now, yes, I am part of chess.com as well. Right. See, I told you, everybody, chess.com. Yes. Uh, I could say something funny there, there, not me. Uh. Um, uh, so there's, a, there's a side events. Interesting, of course, yes. there usually are. Um, it's a. I noticed that um, Irina Crush made the trip out there. She's doing the commentary. Yeah, yeah, that's really terrific. It's great to see her there um, with with Anand. Um, who are the other commentators on other sites? I haven't seen. Does anybody? Jerry must be right. I can't. Yeah, I can't find Yasser, but he must be doing it, right? Oh, yeah. should, um, I don't. Uh, think, I don't. Think, I don't think he is. He made a lot of comments on Spielman's. Twitch today. Spielman's on right. right, but he's not he's not doing any commentary work. But that's either. interesting. It's not just Crush and and Anand. There are other people who are regularly commenting. Sure. Who are yes, those you, commentators? You, Spielman? Spielman's doing it on he has his Twitch channel that he's doing it on. You can get there from Lee Chess. So the, the chess.com team includes Fabiano Caruana and that's Anita right. Gary. That's so right. Chess, and also Tanya Sachev and uh, a few uh, other people. So that's the chess.com commentary team. You, Paul, are talking about the FIDE commentary team, which is Arena Crush and Anand right. in the early rounds. And then in the later rounds, it's Arena uh, Crush and Dubov. Okay. So, but last night or the night before, I, I thought it was uh, Geary and um, uh, Naraditsky. That's, that's what. Yeah, that's they have a huge stuff. team. That includes okay. Naraditsky and Geary and Caruana. They're going to rotate yeah. people around and Tanya Sachev. So chess.com has a lot of people on that team. So what happened to Spiddler and uh, Yasser? Those are my, those two are my favorite. They're hysterical. I like I really like Spiddler and, and Yasser and um and uh Leko. <laughs> yeah, Le well Leko, yeah, but Grishuk, where's Grishuk lately? Not around. I no, don't seem to be around. Spindler always talks about how little he sees and then he reels off some variation, which is unbelievable. Because, you know, he's a, he's a five-time Russian champion. He's quite a player. Yeah. You know, he, he also speaks English better than all Americans. <laughs> uh, yeah. a, he's a great 
commentator. Fantastic. Usually he's with, um, what's his name? Gustafsson. Yeah. yeah. And that's a great team. Lots of fun. It is. Right. Uh, I think the, the one of the greatest commentary of teams I saw was the Spidler Grishuk commentary on the Karyakin and, and Karawana matches. They 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 commented on those matches. That would be fun. Fantastic. Right. High level. Without a chess engine, they didn't use chess engines. Right. The the situation now though is I mean, like for somebody like Grishuk, I, I'm trying to think when he played last. Yeah, Am I, maybe I'm missing something, but I don't think he's played in a long time. For a while, and uh, of course, I think he played in the Blitz. Didn't he play in the World Blitz? Yeah, I think he played in the Rapid and the Blitz, or just okay. the Blitz. But I don't think any classical chess. No, I don't think so. And his wife, uh, uh, Katrina Lano, Lagno, yeah. she's she's you know born you know, Ukrainian born. So, and and the thing is also like you mentioned Dubov, uh, he. He he's given some interviews. Uh, you know, everybody knows about Karyakin because uh, you know these are interviews about the Ukraine, you know, Russia conflict. And uh, uh, Dubov, he he like, you know, he, he well, pretty much all the top Russian players, with the exception of with the notable exception of Karyakin. Have been, you know, very much against the war, and uh, uh, and and now we see, like, you know, a number of players have changed their country of affiliation, uh, or are not being heard from. Yeah, or not, or just not playing hardly right. at all. And no, so, a good point also is that the reason why Ding is playing is because Karyakin was pushed out of the uh, out of the candidates tournament, and and Ding was his replacement. Best. That's how he qualified. Right. So he came right. second. Right. And 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 Karyakin, uh did receive a, a special uh, award, of, like some sort of like you know hero of Russia from uh, uh, Putin by way of compensation. Yeah, uh, yeah. He he's uh, he was born in the in Crimea. That is uh, Karyakin, and uh, uh, yeah. you know he uh, he's never been rated like in the top three in the world. I don't believe, but. Did remarkably well, like in all the candidates' tournaments he played, and won Norway and, twice. Right, right, and also, uh, you know, he was tied with uh, uh, Carlson until they got to the uh, the tiebreak. Right. So, just you know, tremendous player. They, you know, the, they call him the Minister of Defense. You know, who really rises to the occasion when playing. You know, the very, very best. But uh, but he has some not so attractive political ideas in my opinion. Wasn't Karyakin? Um, Napomniachi's second. Oh, well, I'm sure. Yeah, at one point Dur yeah. during the World Championship match with Carlson, I think yeah. he was his second. Yeah, he was. And um, people blamed Karya blamed the results on on. Well, some people thought that Karyakin was not the right second for Napomniachi. The, the mm -hmm. sort of the emphasis on solid play and so on sure. was not in Napomniachi's style. This is an interesting world championship match. I think it it could get really, you know, if if Dink can come back and, um, you know, make a showing for himself, this could be a great match. But right he just now, has to, if he wins one game, his confidence shoots up, and you got Nepo sort of doesn't like to lose. I mean, right. and he plays much weaker after a loss. Yeah. But yeah, I would like to see something besides 4H3. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I mean, about A3. It probably says something for my age. That I just, you know, yeah. I, 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 it would, I would like, you know, to see, you know, more sort of traditional fight. But those engines really, uh, you know, you know, you, the risk is you'll play like 25 moves of theory and everything will kind of just peter out. So there's a reason why they do what they do. I have a feeling, Magnus, uh, Mike, uh, Mike Anderson's asking, why isn't Magnus commenting? I have a feeling that we're going to hear from Magnus about this match mm. at some point. Right I now. Don't think so. But no. Yeah, okay. But the other question is their feed seems to be overdue in issuing their report. What report? 
the report about Magnus and uh, and Hans. And oh, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to kind of oh, no, no, wind her up, that she's going to be wound up. No, don't do this. Don't do that. <laughs> I'm waiting for. It. Isn't it late? Like it's week late. It, it was supposed to come out in early April. So, uh, you know, when will that report come out? Maybe they're waiting until after the championship to not sway the politics of things. Well, I mean, the, the participants, I mean, Magnus and uh, Hans are the two. There's a, there's a kind of a standing joke now in Chess Cafe. Can we get through a Chess Cafe without five minutes? minutes away? What the hell? Come on. No. <laughs> are there any more questions about the 2023 World Chess Championship? Thank you, Alyssa. <laughs> I, I guess I, I don't usually attend chess I don't know. but I can say Hans <laughs> will be playing again in May. He has two tournaments. He's playing in at least one in uh, uh, very strong opens in like the Middle East in Dubai. Okay, good. Yes, good. So I saw a picture of him in uh, looking very dashing and and uh, sort of in place in uh, New York in one of the chess squares. Yeah, so Washington, Washington Square. Square. It was Park. Washington that's Square correct. Park. Yeah. yeah. It's on the okay. Upper West Side. That's correct. That's right. Okay. Good. All right. Oh, well, okay. Thank you, everybody, for great. showing up. Um, yes, I want to uh, give a big, big thanks to our fantastic panelists for um, uh, today's talk. We have um, FIDE Master Paul Whitehead. I am John Donaldson, and I am and um, Marshall Chess Club Vice President Sal Matera. Um, we also had our very special guest at the top of our hour um, with the Consul General of um, Kazakhstan, um, Mr. Avdramov, um, who joined us to give some opening comments about the World Chess Championship being held um, in their country for the very first time, this historic matchup between Ding Loren of China and Amiyachi of Russia. Um, any closing comments from our esteemed panel? Yes. Um, if you're not already a member of Chess Cafe, you can um, join on by going to our page on Jumbula and signing up for Chess Cafe. We meet every Monday, rain or shine. Um, but not on holidays. And not on holidays. That's right. Thank you. Thank you for putting the link in the chat. Um, and um, that's it for me. One last piece of news. I noticed that uh, Vinay Bot, who is a grandmaster from the Bay Area, who uh, developed as a chess player here, he has a new book about his chess career that just came out by a uh, chess that could well be worth checking out. Well, we'll have to get that in the library, John, for sure. For sure. Yeah. Great. Okay. Sal, any parting comments? It's no, late. Uh, you. Thank you for the invitation. I was delighted to be here. It's great. Good to see you. Sam. Thanks. Thanks, Sal. You. Thanks, everybody, for showing up. I think we're going to wrap it up. Yeah, we will wrap up the official portion of our special chess cafe. Um, I will stop the recording, and if people want to hang out for a, a moment longer, you're most welcome. <laughs> <laughs>